Good afternoon. On Monday, we're going to release the updated public health modeling because you deserve the facts. You deserve to hear from the same experts and get the same information that I have access to as Premier. On Monday, we will see how far we've come, how far we still have to go. And this data will help us chart the course for the coming weeks and months. My friends, our efforts are paying off. And I know that we are all eager to get back to work and get back to normal. But the reality is we have to remember that until we find a vaccine for this terrible virus, until we have that vaccine, letting our guard down means potentially exposing millions of our people to the virus. So any decision around reopening must be based on the best medical advice. And these decisions will not be taken lightly. The hard fact is, until we find a vaccine, going back to normal means putting lives at risk. And that's why today we're announcing a historic investment. We're putting $20 million towards Ontario-based research into COVID-19 because the world needs a vaccine and there's no reason why that vaccine can't be found right here in Ontario. We are the province that discovered insulin. Our medical researchers are at the forefront of the fight against cancer. We were pioneers of open heart surgery. We have some of the best research facilities and hospitals in the world, right here in Ontario. My friends, we have the brightest minds in the world, the most educated people, and there's nothing we can't do. In fact, there are research programs underway right now here in Ontario, as we speak, searching for a vaccine. We should hold our heads high and we should all be proud that Ontario scientists are on the front lines of COVID-19 research efforts. And with today's investment, we're putting our full support behind these incredible minds. We're funding the most advanced medical research. We're giving our scientists the critical funding they need to give us the vaccine we need. My friends, Ontario is a province of great ingenuity, the brightest minds, the smartest people, the best of the best are here in this province. These funds will support them because when Ontarians put their mind to something and they have the right support, they get it done. It's these bright minds, that grit and determination. It's this spirit, the Ontario spirit, that gives us hope in these dark times. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll pass it over to Minister Romano. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Premier. Since we first learned of the spread of COVID-19, we have been di diligently monitoring the situation and we have been taking decisive action to try to stop the spread of this virus. We have been working as a cabinet, along with all of my colleagues, with a number one priority in mind. And that priority is, has been, and, ha and will always be the safety and the health of every person in the province of Ontario. All of my colleagues are working around the clock, along under, under the great leadership of our Premier, and we are working to contain this virus and help to find a vaccine. I want to specifically speak with you about some of the initiatives going on within my ministry, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities. Within the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, I'm also responsible for research and science. And as the Premier has just indicated, our researchers are world renowned for what they do. For years, many years, International private sector firms have been investing in Ontario-based research because they know that we are amongst the best. And Ontario, our government, we recognize that we are the best as well. And we want to help find that vaccine. And we believe 
we can find that vaccine right here in Ontario. That is why we have announced here today that we are investing an additional $20 million in Ontario's COVID-19 Rapid Research Fund. This money will be dedicated towards receiving proposals and we will be leveraging all of the great expertise within the post-secondary industry as well as our industry and nonprofit scientific partners to help us prioritize proposals. We want to secure proposals that have a high chance of success and that can do so in a very quick fashion. We want to find a vaccine at the soonest possible opportunity like all of you. That is our priority and we are leveraging the strength of some of the best researchers in the entire world. I can't underscore that enough because we do have them right here in Ontario. I want to speak to you a bit about some of the incredible work that's already been done within our universities and within our research sector. For instance, three weeks ago, Sunnybrook Hospital, working with the University of Toronto and McMaster University, were able to isolate the COVID-19 virus. That is the first step towards finding that vaccine. Right now, over the course of the last several days, again, University of Toronto, McMaster University, University of Ottawa, and many, many others have been taking donations of blood and plasma from people who have already recovered from COVID-19. They're doing this because that is a step towards not only finding a vaccine, but towards treating COVID-19. We continue to work around the clock. We continue to support our sector in this regard because we want to ensure that we find a solution to COVID-19 for the entire world because we know that we could do so right here in Ontario. I am so proud of the work being done by our sector. I'm so proud of all the work being done by all of our colleges and universities. The gathering of PPE, the production of PPE for our frontline workers has been nothing short of incredible. I've said that before and I will say it again. But today, what we are here to announce is that we are making this investment in our research facilities, an additional $20 million so that we can find the vaccine for COVID-19. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll go to the phone line for questions. First question. First question comes from <coughs> Chanel Call from CP24. Please go ahead. Hi there, Premier. Thank Hi. you for taking my question. I just want to ask you about uh, what the province may be doing to help out cities like Toronto uh, with relief costs. We've heard from the mayor here we could be looking uh, at a hit of at least $1.5 billion. Yeah, actually, I just got off the phone with the, the mayor. I had a great conversation uh, with him, and, and uh, we're putting together plans with the municipal affairs uh, minister, and that's... Uh, Minister Clark, and he'll be working with all municipalities across the the province, and uh, we'll do whatever uh, we can uh, based on our capacity. And I always say, um, you know, we don't have the printing press. Uh, the federal government has the printing press, but we won't leave a penny on the table when it comes to uh, supporting people throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, Premier, but um, just looking at the numbers today coming from the province, um, and it included a note that it may not have Toronto public health numbers included in those numbers, and that was because of a technical issue. Can you just explain what happened there and uh, how that's being addressed? Well, I'll pass that over to the Minister of Health. There was a situation where the uh, City of Toronto's data wasn't able to be fed into the provincial data, but we are working on that. We hope to have that problem uh, resolved very quickly, but it is something that we will be incorporating, of course, uh, because this data is so important across the province, including what's happening in the City of Toronto. Next question. Next question comes from Kari Birma from CBC News. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Premier and Ministers. There's growing calls from frontline workers for the province to step in and take control of Eatonville and Anson Place Centre. The union representing the workers at these facilities wrote to both you, the Premier, and you, Deputy Premier Elliott, saying that members on the front line have lost all confidence that everything that can be done is being done. With the number of outbreaks and the deaths at long-term care facilities in Ontario continuing to rise while the province follow the leads of Quebec, BC, and Alberta, 
and start taking administrative and operational control of these facilities to stop the outbreaks? And if not, why, when you're hearing from the front line that they're saying management isn't doing enough? Well, first of all, that's right in my own backyard. It's an absolute tragedy uh, what's happening uh, there. And, and I'd like to uh, pass this over uh, to the Minister of Long-Term Care. But I just want to tell you, a whole team from Trillium Health are, are in there and, and supporting those uh, people. But I'll pass this over to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you. So as uh, you heard the Premier say, uh, Trillium Health and Toronto Public Health are in at Eatonville as we speak. And uh, Ontario um, is not in the, um, is not, does not manage homes. That is uh, the way our system has evolved. However, we do um, work to create the uh, coordination with uh, management groups that will go in and help our long-term care homes. We are actively uh, aware of the homes that are at the most risk and working diligently round the clock to make sure that they are getting the support that they need and that is happening and this is happening across the province. Uh, we have also stepped up with uh, and I want to give a shout out to the community paramedics all across Ontario who've done over a thousand swabs in our long-term care homes for over three weeks and every opportunity we have to mobilize every option that we have and you've heard the premier say every option is on the table right now we have a coordinated effort through our action plan to use the uh, the expertise in hospitals and public health uh, to help our uh, our homes that are struggling and i guess as a follow-up to that to both the uh, minister of long-term care and minister of health we have the Ontario Nurses Association launching court action against long-term care facilities, those two that I mentioned before, as well as Henley Place in London. But, like, why won't the province do more to step in when we're hearing so many grave concerns from frontline workers that do not have the faith in the management of these long-term care facilities? Why is it that Quebec, Alberta, and British Columbia have viewed this as a critical action, but Ontario has yet to do that? even though we have this wildfire premier, as you describe it, running through the long-term care facilities in this problem? Well, this, is, this uh, situation in Ontario, uh, how we manage homes or how we support the management of homes, has evolved differently from BC and Quebec. And I, I'm not going to speak about BC and Quebec. I need to speak about all the actions we're taking here and that we have done uh, all along in a very decisive way from the very beginning. And we are coordinating with our homes. It's a coordination between Ontario Health, Public Health, our acute care hospitals, home care. And so it is a, a different approach. But I can tell you, that everything is on the table. We are sparing no expense to make sure that our homes get the support that they need. And the action plan uh, from uh, uh, most recently, the next step up in this, uh, is a, is a um, approach that we're taking actively. If you look around the world, long-term care homes across the world are being affected and impacted similarly to COVID-19. It is a new virus. It spreads differently. And we're taking the advice of our Chief Medical Officer of Health here in Ontario, working with our public health units to identify the homes at risk and getting them there so the support that they need. And that is actively happening. Next question. Next question comes from Salman Farouki from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier Ford. Um, we saw a bit of optimism for the first time yesterday from the federal government and from various provinces. As people see the numbers improve on COVID-19, they're naturally going to wonder more about when things can go back to normal. Um, what can you tell them about that? Well, again, I, I'm going to always refer back to the chief medical officer, and I, I keep saying it, but I'll continue saying it. Uh, this will be based on uh, health and science. And once we get the, the green light, uh, we can move forward. Uh, you have to understand, Ontario is a massive, massive province, bigger than, than countries over in Europe, um, you know, twice the size almost of Texas. So what, what is, uh, you know, what's happening in a big urban center, be it Toronto, uh, may not be happening in, in rural areas. Um, if, you, if you start at the top, of, of Ontario and go to the southern border up further uh, by Ottawa and go follow that all the way around, all the way up to Kenora, it's, it's further than driving from Toronto down to Florida. 
So all regions aren't the same, and uh, it's a province of uh, two tails. You know, you, you have the urban area, then you have the, the rural area. That, and I, I talked to someone up in the northwest region. It's, uh, you know, three, 300 miles. They have uh, six cases, square miles. So again, uh, we're going to base this on health and uh, get the advice off the chief medical officer. But uh, right now, uh, we aren't ready to, to do anything right, right at this point. And as a follow-up, um, there's been talk from various provinces about eventually easing restrictions after the first phase sort of ends, but then tightening them up against when a second wave hits. And I don't know if you can go into um, between the first and second wave, if there's much of an idea um, what could be eased and what cannot be eased. Well, I'll pass that over to the Minister of Health. Well, as the Premier indicated, we have to take our advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health we have since the, uh, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in this province, and we will continue to do so. But we need to make sure that we, we are not premature with that, that we need to make sure that uh, the, the spread in the community has uh, come to a point where it's safe to loosen some of those restrictions. We are continuing to uh, follow that advice. We're looking at it very carefully. So we're not through the first wave yet. So I think it would be premature to uh, contemplate the second wave because we want to make sure that it's going to be completely safe to loosen some of those restrictions when, whenever we're able to do so. What we certainly don't want is to have another um, uh, explosion in the number of cases coming forward. So we have to do this in a careful, measured, thoughtful way based on science and based on evidence. Next question. Next question comes from Janice Golding from CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, yes. Uh, just Hi. following up on some of the questions that we've just heard, um, we just wanted to know the City of Toronto met today, senior officials, to talk about reopening um, in a phased manner. Now they say that we're not ready for that yet, as you've mentioned. But to you, what would reopening in a phased manner mean? Well, I, again, uh, I, I, I have to go back to what, I, what I've always been saying. Uh, I want to make sure it's based on health and science. And I don't want to put pe people in jeopardy uh, around this province. That, that's really what it comes down to. And uh, again, there's different regions in the province, but it's all based on health and uh, science. So once we get the green light, uh, then, then we can move methodically, slowly, and, and make the transition, but uh, I'm, I'm not rushing into this and not opening up the floodgates. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna make sure that we, we do it under the advice of the chief medical officer. And I understand there's 34 of them across the province and some opinions may differ, but I have to take the advice of our, our chief medical officer here in Ontario. Okay, and as a follow-up of that, um, as you mentioned, Toronto has a much higher incidence of cases, uh, whereas uh, in the Northwest, there are only yeah. six cases in 300 square miles. I mean, my family lives in Cochrane, Ontario, so I, I, I know understand. that area pretty well. Yeah. Um, are you thinking about potentially opening up, and because you're saying there's a tale of two places, yeah. uh, are you thinking of potentially opening up urban centers at a later point than you are thinking of opening up uh, rural locations, for example? Well, I, I, again, if our chief medical officer of, of health shows us modeling and, uh, and through consultation and cooperation uh, through those regions, uh, then we'll sit down and, and, and talk about it. But until then, uh, we're just going to hold still right now. And I, I can't put uh, millions of people's lives in jeopardy. All it takes is two or three people from Toronto to show up into Cochrane and, and uh, that's it. It's, it's game over. Uh, up there and uh, what I don't want to do is what you see in other cities you open up and then a second wave hits you and then you have to close down again um, we just have to be so cautious and it is so so difficult uh, decision to shut down the economy in my opinion it's going to be twice as difficult to try to open this up and, and do it methodically and and because I, I hear you uh, you know if you talk to your family do you sell family in Cochrane my aunt, yeah, well, uh, my they, uncle, yeah. I've got a lot, cousins. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're probably gnawing at the bit to get out there and get things done. I, I can appreciate that because I hear from a lot of rural folks around this province and what's happening in the rural areas is not happening in the urban city. So uh, again, we're, we're going to take the advice of the medical professionals. 
Next question. Next question comes from Jeff Gray from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, everybody. Thanks for taking my question. Thank you. Probably directed to Dr. Fullerton. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about if you can say anything specifically about what uh, the provincial staff, the Trillium people, or health officials are doing, in, particularly in these two long-term care homes that we're all talking about. What, what is being done? Are they helping with the staff there? Or are they providing more PPE or advice on cleaning? Or what the, specifically is the province doing to try and uh, help them? It would be all of those. So as in the action plan, there were efforts to allow the acute care hospitals to contribute to our homes that are having difficulties with staffing. So that's the first section. The expertise that we have at hospitals through the infection prevention and control teams, that's the second part. And looking at um, the expertise that can go into the homes and advise them in terms of how they could be doing any kind of care differently so that the SWAT team um, act actively on the ground. So that's a combination of Trillium Health and public, Toronto Public Health. And it really is going to take everyone collaborating, working together uh, to address the issues surrounding the, the staffing. And this was something we've been actively working on since the beginning for months, understanding that every decision that we make may have an impact on staffing and how to shore that up. It's been a conscious effort the whole way through. Um, but as I've said, this, this virus affects the over 80-year-old groups uh, in a devastating way. And uh, we are taking every measure that we can using new tools, uh, infection control and prevention, absolutely critical. And that's what the teams are doing um, in terms of the staffing, in terms of the preparedness in the homes. We've also closed down any admissions from hospital to homes, uh, particularly any homes that would be um, not in outbreak. Traditionally, there, there would be movement uh, with admissions when we stop that. Uh, we know the risk is in the community, spreading into the homes, taking every measure possible and developing new tools. Uh, and just as a follow-up to that, um, you know, you've said a couple times that, that Ontario isn't, uh, it, it runs things differently in this sector and it yeah. isn't going to take over the management of these homes, but the Long-Term Care uh, Act does give the government the power to appoint new managers if uh, the homes are being run in a way that's unsafe. Uh, is that something you're considering? Well, that is something that we can do, and as I've mentioned before, we can coordinate that. If homes reach out, they're having difficulties, uh, that is exactly what happens. Um, but the, the long Ministry of Long-Term Care, as you know, uh, was started uh, last summer. Uh, it does not have capacity nor historically uh, managed homes, and that's how we coordinate efforts to, to help homes get through these difficulties. Everything is being done. Last question. Our question comes from Morgan Campbell from Global News. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. I wanted to ask quickly, what is, what is a timeline that we can suspect that maybe we might be able to get some good solid research into a potential vaccine? And, and why, why 20 million? Why not more? <clears throat> 20 million? Uh, in, I think that's a question for, for uh, Minister Romano. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, the determination to increase by $20 million was uh, based on some of the information that we have uh, within our ministry based on what the fund already was at. We wanted to increase that because we wanted to make a specific measure uh, for our research institutions. We already saw work being done. I already saw it cited earlier the work that had been done at U of T, McMaster, and uh, Sunnybrook, and we saw that continuing on. We saw this as an opportunity to put out a fund that uh, the research sector within, um, within Ontario that our universities could uh, apply to. I want to take this opportunity to say that the deadline for applications is April 24th. Applications can go through the Ontario Together website through the Ideas stream, and we want um, proposals that uh, we think are going to produce highly achievable results and that will uh, be done so in an immediate fashion. We're looking at things that uh, can be accommodated within as early as a year, upwards of two years as an absolute maximum. But, you know, to try to really get right down to your question, that it's, it's a situation of we saw an opportunity because we recognize how strong our research institutions, how strong our facilities are, our universities. And so we made the investment because uh, 
ultimately at the end of the day if we don't make the investment uh, we won't see the proposals and we want to see those and i can tell you that the proposals that we have received to date have been extremely encouraging and uh, we feel very optimistic that uh, we will find an ontario-based solution and uh, we want the, uh, the the vaccine for COVID to come from ontario and that is why we made the the uh, the investment thank you and just a quick follow-up to that or is any of this research or re researchers working with other countries? Um, currently, I know you did cite some of the work that was that was being done um, so far, but are they working with other provinces, other countries um, to to expand on this? Uh, the work that we was being done uh, previous to the announcement uh, was coming uh, from a number of our universities and our research sector uh, facilities within Ontario. Uh, we are looking for an Ontario-based solution. Uh, I don't think there would ever be a closed-mindedness towards working with other groups, but right now we're focusing in on an Ontario-based solution. We know that our Ontario researchers are amongst the very best in the world. I can't underscore that enough. Uh, the types of investments you see other world uh, organizations will bring into Ontario because they recognize the strength of our research is something that we want to capitalize on. And we know that we are amongst the best and we want to try to find an Ontario-based solution uh, to this vaccine or to this crisis by finding a vaccine here in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend.